tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hey there, everybody. Looks like another year in the books. Hey, can you believe they still call it Dick Clark's New Year's Rockin' Eve? The guy's nothing but bones in a men's warehouse tuxedo now. And then there's Ryan Seacrest, like yesterday's potatoes. I know you're excited about Duran Duran, Chester, but you can't sit on the couch. Duran Duran. Man, those guys are older than Dick Clark. Come on in, friend. Let's get started. Mm. Oh, that's better. And this one's for you, John Loundis. Uh, we're back off the wagon. So smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. God damn, that one hit hard. Whew. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. Riga, 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 my lord. Howdy. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu and sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole kit and caboodle, including millions of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012. Ready to throw your hat in the ring, authors? Send your stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, shit, you'll get the full treatment. So, tonight we introduce a brand new genre. Legal horror. The scariest thing since John Grissom wrote his first and only sex scene. Didn't go over so well with his wife, I heard. Allegedly, she hasn't touched his dick since 2018. Just kidding. Or am I? So, without further delay, from author Brian Asbury, I give you a token of gratitude. There's a certain impersonal charm to grocery stores. People pass each other, usually avoiding eye contact, and cloaked in a security blanket of inconspicuousness. And the homeless that you often find outside these places, well, they might as well be a light pole or a park bench, hiding in plain sight. Duncan Wickman was a busy man, much too busy to give back to those in need. But today was different. Today, whether you call it humanity or good in the world, his graciousness overrode his apathy, and he took time out of his day to show compassion to the less fortunate. A simple act that would change the course of his life forever. Duncan looked down at his Rolex as he stood in line, holding a pack of spring greens mix and a bottle of sweet tea. He knew he was probably late for something, but just what it was escaped him. As he scurried out the grocery store, a homeless man sitting next to the Coke machine called out to him. Hey, buddy, you got any change? Duncan, who would normally keep walking, stopped and turned around. A charitable feeling seemed to come over him. You thirsty? He asked the man. Sure, I'd take a soda. Duncan smiled as he set his bag on the ground and pulled out his wallet. He put two dollars in the machine and handed the man a soda. The homeless man smiled widely as he cracked it open and took a swig. He sat the drink down and shuffled through his backpack, then pulled out a dirty glass beer mug. Here, it's a token of my gratitude. He held the mug in the air towards Duncan, who reluctantly grabbed it. Uh, thanks, Duncan said. He dumped out the cigarette butts that were scattered in the bottom as he walked towards his car in the parking lot. He opened his door and threw it into the back seat. That evening after he got home, he grabbed his briefcase out of the car along with the mug that laid next to it on the seat. What's that? His wife Lillian asked curiously as she chopped some vegetables in the kitchen. Their son Aiden burst out from around the corner and hugged Duncan. It was a gift. A token of gratitude, he said with a smirk. I bought a soda for a bum outside of the Albertsons, and he gave this to me. Lillian got a surprised look on her face. Since when did you start associating with those people? I don't know. Something just kind of came over me. 
Well, just be careful. So many of them are either crazies or high on drugs. Duncan chuckled as he washed out the mug under the kitchen faucet. I was homeless once. Shut up, she replied. No, really. I shot my dad in the eye with a rubber band gun, and he got so mad, I ran out of the house and spent the next night at a campground near where we lived. Survived off of beef jerky and Pez candy. She laughed. I don't think that counts. Duncan wiped off the beer mug and held it up to the light as he looked it over. He could tell by how heavy it was that it was probably commercial made. It cleaned up nicely, he thought to himself. April 20th. Hi, Duncan. The secretary of his law firm said in her nasally voice. This is kind of strange, but we just had two of our main clients terminate their contracts with us. Duncan sat up in his office chair and a look of concern came over his face. What? Don't tell me one was the Saunders trial. There was a brief pause. Yes, that was one, and also Dominique Fratelli. Shit! Well, did they say why? Saunders is citing that you're not returning his phone calls, and Fratelli says that you haven't been listening to his wishes. I wasn't able to return Saunders' phone call yesterday because my phone locked me out for some reason, and Fratelli needs to take a plea bargain. Otherwise, they're gonna fry his ass. Duncan spent Saturday at the driving range with some colleagues. Would you believe that son of a bitch Dean Saunders just dropped me as his attorney? The trial of the decade and midway through he decides to terminate me. Duncan swung his club fiercely, launching his golf ball downrange. The group of men looked around at each other. Actually, Duncan, Saunders is now my client. He called me a few days ago, Tony Spicola said. Eh, you know how it goes sometimes. I couldn't say no. Duncan, despite the surprised look on his face, tried to play it off. Hey, business is business, right? You're not upset, are you? Duncan grinned sourly. Upset? No. Don't worry about it. Tony smirked. Good, because afterwards I put a down payment on the condo for me and Brittany. Duncan spoke with Lillian after he got home. I just can't believe the balls Tony has to take a client of mine like that. Listen, it's one client. And if you were in Tony's shoes with an opportunity like that, what would you do? Well, I would hope that I wouldn't fuck a friend over like that. Maybe you should start advertising again. He sighed and looked away dismissively. I haven't had to advertise in years. Lillian rubbed his back with a look of despair on her face. Just think about it, okay? May 3rd. This was a case of mistaken identity. The state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that my client, Mr. Javier Garcia, assaulted Mr. Williams on December 18, 2021. Numerous witnesses have corroborated his accounts that he was instead visiting with friends, miles from where the alleged assault took place. Even Mr. Williams himself has contradicted his own testimony. Your Honor, Today we seek an acquittal of all charges. This concludes the defense evidence, Duncan said, then smiled confidently. The judge exited to his quarters for a recess. Duncan turned to his client. The only thing you gotta worry about now is where you're gonna celebrate at after we win this. The judge returned to his bench after a short time. Mr. Javier Garcia has been charged with assault causing bodily injury. In particular, it is alleged that on the evening of December 18th, 2021, Mr. Garcia brutally attacked Mr. Darius Williams after an altercation that the two men had. The judge looked towards Duncan. Sometimes relying on questionable friends and acquaintances as witnesses doesn't always present the most solid foundation for a defense case. That coupled with the circumstantial evidence that the state has presented, I conclude that the state has established its case against Mr. Garcia beyond a reasonable doubt. Mr. Garcia, I would ask that you stand now. I therefore find you guilty of first-degree assault and sentence you to ten months in the Pueblo County Detention Center. Duncan had a look of shock on his face. Questionable witnesses, he mumbled. His client looked over at him, grimacing. Don't worry, we're going to appeal this, Duncan whispered to him. 
The judge didn't like the fact that one of the witnesses was a prostitute that Garcia hired for the night. He held it against them, the whole trial, Duncan said to Lillian as he undid his tie. She listened from the bathroom. Well, you can appeal it, right? Oh, I'm gonna appeal it, that's for sure. He walked over to the dresser and grabbed his glass of scotch and took a drink. The drinks were becoming stiffer and more frequent. Lillian walked in the room. Another one? Duncan flung his arms in the air. Yes, Lillian, I'm having a drink. It's been a long day and I'm trying to relax, okay? Duncan had been sober for seven years. It didn't mean he didn't enjoy it and have a drink every now and then, but he hadn't had an incident for quite some time. It was always in the back of his wife's mind, and with anyone who's an addict, relapse is always a hellish reality. She looked at him with a sinking look on her face. I just don't want you to get in that place you were in when you were drinking heavy. Christ, what is it with you? You just have to keep bringing up my shortcomings, don't you? It's not enough that I have my own law firm. It's not enough that I buy you this beautiful house that we can't even fucking afford to live in. He turned away and took a deep breath. Then he turned around and walked towards Lillian, who had tears in her eyes. He put his arms around her. <sighs> I'm sorry. I've just been under a lot of stress lately and was self-medicating again, which I know isn't the answer. I love you, and I don't want you to have to worry. June 10th With business decline and Duncan had finally caved in, he stood in his office surrounded by a film crew as he began shooting for a commercial. The director was a young, overzealous film school graduate who treated the shoot more like a trailer for the next Expendables movie. He carefully positioned Duncan, who was holding a sledgehammer next to his certificates on the wall. Listen, you're Duncan the Hammer. So when I yell action, I want you to swing your hammer over your head. This was totally ridiculous, Duncan thought to himself. But he went along with it anyway. Okay, action. He swung the sledgehammer over his head. I'm Duncan Whitman, but my clients call me the sledgehammer. Over the years, I've helped thousands of people win their cases. That takes experience and aggressiveness. God, the director yelled. He spoke to a producer off to the side between takes. I never thought I'd be advertising again. The producer cracked a smile. TV advertising's a no-brainer. After a few weeks, your phone will be ringing off the hook. June 29th. It had been just over two weeks since Duncan's commercial first aired on TV. He laid a stack of papers on the secretary's desk. So, any new clients so far this week? He asked. One today, divorce case. But actually, business seems to have slowed down more. Duncan put his head down. <sighs> Fuck. He whispered under his breath. He looked up with a distant look in his eyes. What's going on? I went from averaging 10 to 12 cases at once to two all of a sudden. I've never had this little of a caseload ever, even when I was starting out. His secretary looked up at him. Maybe I could stand in front of the office twirling a sign, she said in her dry, sarcastic tone. Duncan frowned. So much for that damn commercial. Have you even seen it playing? She nodded. Yes, I've already seen it twice today. He sighed. Well, at least I can pay you to do something. August 3rd. Duncan laid wide awake next to Lillian in bed when he suddenly turned to her. I was thinking about asking a couple of the guys that I play golf with if they could use another attorney in their office. What are you talking about? She said groggily. I can't afford to keep the firm open. I don't have the business anymore. She removed her sleep mask. You've just had a bad couple of months. Well, I can't afford to have another bad month. This isn't something that I want to do. This lifestyle that we've become accustomed to. I don't know how much longer we can maintain it. After playing a few holes at Saturday's golf game, Duncan finally managed to open his throat up wide enough to swallow his pride. So, uh, on a professional note, would any of you guys be interested in a merger of sorts? Duncan said as the men walked toward the clubhouse. 
Dennis Bates turned around. Merger. Duncan put his head down. I think I'm going to end up closing the firm. What? Dennis said, shocked. Since when did Duncan Wickman ever have to worry about keeping his doors open? Well, Dennis, up until about three months ago, I guess, he replied. Anyway, if any of you could use my services, I'd look at it as a personal favor. The men all looked around at one another, and there was an empty silence. Dennis finally spoke up. I'll keep you in mind, Duncan. Then Harry Campbell chimed in. I just hired two interns. I only hire females, Tony laughed inappropriately. No, I'm kidding. I'll keep you in mind, pal. Duncan nodded glumly. September 17th. Duncan stared longingly at his law degree certificate and thought about the feeling that he got when he won his first case. He pulled a shooter of bourbon from his shirt pocket and took a drink. Then he threw the empty bottle onto the floor. You can clean it up, you sons of bitches, he mumbled to himself pitifully. The doors had closed on his practice a few weeks earlier, and he packed up the last of his belongings. Later that afternoon, he lugged the packing boxes downstairs at their house when he heard Lillian's car pull into the garage. Hello, she called out. Down here. Lillian went downstairs to see Duncan putting away boxes. When he turned and faced her, the smile quickly left her face. What's wrong? Duncan asked. You're drunk again, aren't you? Duncan tried to hide it, but he couldn't conceal the smell of whiskey on his breath. No, why would she think that? He said, slurring his words. Liar, Lillian said as she darted upstairs. Duncan threw the box down he was holding and clenched his fist, knowing that he blew it again. The glass beer mug that was packed inside fell out onto the floor, making a loud thud, and rolled next to his foot. He reached down curiously and picked it up. He looked at it, surprised that it didn't shatter, then threw it back into the box. I want you to start going to AA meetings again, Lillian said after she was sure that Duncan had sobered up. He turned to her. Fine, I'll start back up tomorrow, right after I get out of the unemployment line, he scowled. When I asked the guys if they had any openings at their firms, they couldn't even offer me a position as a janitor, he said bitterly. September 23rd The following week was turbulent between Duncan and his wife. They barely made eye contact, let alone spoke. Then one day, Duncan came home, holding a bouquet of roses. I came with a peace treaty, he said, as he smiled and handed them to Lillian. She took them and looked down at the ground tepidly. He gently grabbed her arms and gazed at her. Look, we can start over. You, me, and Aiden. I got offered a job. It's a legal assistant, not exactly what I was wanting, but it's a foot in the door. Lillian looked up and smiled softly. And we can sell this place. It's too much house for the three of us anyway. Her smile wavered. But I love this house. I do too, but there's no way we can stay here on my income now. She nodded heavy-heartedly. October 5th. Duncan and his wife sat in the office of a realtor they had hired to sell their house. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Wickman. So I ran the numbers and I have a little bit of troubling news. You folks had your home built a few years back when the housing market was hot. You've heard the term a seller's market, right? Well, now we're in a buyer's market. The feds raised interest rates and now we have more homes for sale than we have buyers. It's not as bad yet as the crash in 08, but I think you're going to be underwater. Duncan looked over at Lillian nervously. So, you owe a little over 800000 on your mortgage. After comparing recently sold properties and similar homes on the market, I think a fair asking price would be more like 715 715 Duncan blurted out. Uh, that's almost 100000 less than what we owe. I understand that, and you can always ask for more. The problem lies in the bank. Banks don't typically want to give borrowers more money than what a property appraises for. There's a chance that you'll have a buyer that brings cash to the table, and in that situation, you may get your asking price. The two looked at each other. 
Could you just give us a few minutes to talk things over? Duncan asked the realtor. Absolutely. I'll just step into the office next door, and when you're ready, just come get me. Duncan turned to Lillian. So here's what I'm thinking. We list a house for what we owe on it, plus his commission. I can just pull from my IRA if we come up short on our payments in the meantime. But that's our retirement money, Lillian said worriedly under her breath. I know, but I don't think we have any other option at the moment. Duncan got their realtor's attention and he stepped back into the room. So me and my wife had decided to list our home for the balance on our mortgage, plus your commission, so 840000 The realtor got a surprised look on his face. Wow, ambitious. Okay, well, like I said, there's a chance we might luck out and get a cash buyer. But otherwise, he nodded, but not in an affirming way. We just don't want to scare off any potential buyers, if you know what I mean. Duncan smiled ambivalently. I understand, and we're prepared for that. On Monday, Duncan started his new position at the Rosso Law Group. He'd be working under one of the lawyers there and spent the morning getting briefed on his responsibilities. So, Duncan, I understand that you are a practicing attorney, so a lot of these tasks may seem a little mundane, but just know I'm happy to have someone of your caliber working for me. The young man paused, then smiled. Maybe this could even lead to a promotion for you. Who knows? Duncan felt small and insignificant at that moment. I was winning cases before this kid even had hair on his balls, he thought to himself. He forced a grin. Thanks. I'm just happy to be a part of the team. December 20th The weeks turned into months, and besides a few lackluster showings, their home still remained on the market. Duncan walked through the master bathroom with their realtor. Are you sure you're showing the buyers all the features of this place? He pointed at the jacuzzi. Look at this custom tile work. I mean, you just don't see stuff like this. This place is stunning. It's very grand. I just think that this is one of those places that takes the right person to see it. And unfortunately in Pueblo, we just don't have the clientele. Now, if it were Denver, on the other hand, there's a good chance that it would have already sold. The realtor paused. Duncan, I'm going to shoot straight with you. It might be time that you and your wife call your bank and look into lowering the price. Neither one of us want to waste our time here. That night, Duncan filed a hardship letter. He decided that their best option would be to lower the price of their home through a short sale. Once this place sells, the bank should forget the difference, he said to Lillian as he typed at his laptop. Our credit score might take a hit, but it's better than a foreclosure. January 8th Duncan nervously opened the letter addressed from their bank and read the contents. He threw it on the table with a sigh of disgust. What's wrong? Lillian asked. There was a long pause. It's a deficiency action. She had a puzzled look on her face. Basically, they want whatever we still owe on the house after it sells. Her face twisted with concern. But what about the hardship letter that you filed? Duncan scowled. They're bloodsuckers! He shook his head. If you wouldn't have wanted this damn house, we wouldn't be in this mess. Lillian teared up. That's not fair. Duncan stared at her eerily. Oh, I'll tell you what's not fair. Watching the business that you built crumble to the ground. Or having your retirement fund drained in a matter of months. Lillian sobbed. I just want our future together. Future? What future? I'm working as an entry-level legal assistant, making grocery store wages. We just lost our house, for Christ's sake, Lillian! Duncan looked up and saw Aiden watching tearfully from the top of the stairs. I can't do this anymore, Lillian said as tears streamed down her face. I want out. Duncan arrived at work 40 minutes late the following day, stumbling into the office. Tyler, the lawyer he was working for, glanced at his watch, then walked up to him. Duncan, is everything all right? I was just... the traffic was bad. He was so intoxicated that he could barely complete a sentence. Duncan, you can't be here like this. Joe, could you give me a hand here? Tyler called out. I'm going to get you home. Amber, take a message for me until I get back. He told the secretary. 
The two helped Duncan to the parking lot and Tyler drove him home. Duncan came in to work the next morning but was stopped by the secretary before he could make it to his workstation. Duncan, I'm sorry but I believe Tyler needs to have a word with you. If you could just have a seat. She motioned with her head. In the lobby. Tyler showed up a few minutes later. Come on back, Duncan, he said as he ushered him to his office. He paused for a moment, then sighed. I can't have you back here working for me after what happened yesterday. Duncan tried to smooth things over. Listen, about yesterday, I had a really unfortunate set of circumstances arise the day before. But trust me, it won't happen again. I wish I could, but it shouldn't have happened in the first place. There's a chance that if you seek some kind of substance abuse counseling, maybe we could look at rehiring you again in the future. Tyler gestured with his hands. Look, whatever's going on, I'm sorry. There's help out there, though. Duncan's dignity melted into a puddle of goo on the office floor. He stood up and adjusted his tie, trying to maintain whatever composure he had left. Well, thanks for the opportunity and for giving a shit. Or at least pretending to. When he got home, Lillian's car was gone. He stepped inside their house and found a note on the kitchen counter. It read, Going to stay with my parents. Took Aiden with me. This isn't the type of environment to raise a child in. Bitch! He exclaimed, slamming his fist down. In a fit of rage, he drug his hand across the table, sending everything flying onto the floor. A picture frame containing a photo of him and Lillian laid face up and cracked on the ground. January 26th After finally selling their home earlier in the month, Duncan spent the better part of the morning loading his belongings into a moving van. Lillian showed up in the afternoon with her brother to pick up what things she still had left. You can have the furniture. I don't want any reminders of this place, she said to him. A little later, Duncan sat in the garage separating his tools and smoking a joint. He flicked the ashes into the glass beer mug that was now sitting on a workbench. Lillian walked up to him with a surprised look. She gasped. You're smoking pot now? Really, Duncan? He glanced up at her but didn't respond. He just kept sorting as he casually shifted his eyes back to what he was doing. That's a great example you're setting for your son, she said as she shook her head and walked off. The rundown apartment that Duncan was renting looked like a funhouse that was decorated by the Kardashians with his chic Italian furniture in it. He stood back and looked around after he finished unpacking. Looks like law school finally paid off. <laughs> he grabbed his bottle of whiskey off the kitchen counter and took a swig. Four! Dennis Bates yelled as he swung his golf club. He adjusted his glasses as he looked down the range. He turned to Harry Campbell. Who the hell is that? Harry squinted. It looks like Duncan. Duncan showed up drunk, carrying his golf clubs and stumbling towards where the men stood. I know I'm a little bit late, but I was busy consulting with a client. Homicide. Guy offed his wife. His eyes got big. Hey, we can all relate, right? He said darkly. Dennis scowled. You're drunk, Duncan, and you look like hell. That's no way to talk to a fellow colleague, Dennis. Duncan, you need to leave, Tony Spicola said as he grabbed his arm. You get the fuck off me, Duncan exclaimed as he ripped his arm away from Tony's grip. He pointed at the men. Where were any of you when I needed you? He teared up. I gave you a start at my firm, Tony. Then you go and take clients from behind my back. A security guard pulled up in his golf cart. What seems to be the issue here, gentlemen? I'll tell you what the issue is. This maniac is disrupting our game, Dennis said. Duncan spit in his direction. The security guard got out of his cart. Sir, you need to leave this course right now, or I'll be contacting the police. Duncan grinned. Okay, I'll go. He said, staggering backwards. He then frowned menacingly. I'll go. But I won't forget how you all turned your backs on me. February 15th. Lillian heard a knock at her parents' front door. 
Her mother came up to her room a few moments later. Duncan's outside. He's asking to see Aiden. Aiden came running into the room. Daddy! Lillian crouched down and looked him in the eyes. Go into the other room and play with your Lego set, okay? After he ran out of the room, she turned to her mother. It's not good for Aiden to see him like this. Duncan, I'm sorry, but I guess Aiden's not here right now. I don't believe that. He forced his way past her mother. Lillian! Lillian! I want to see my son! Lillian barged out of her room frantically. You need to leave, Duncan, or I'm going to call the police. I haven't seen Aiden in weeks. You can't keep him from me! All of a sudden, her father came up from the basement aiming a shotgun at Duncan. You're in no condition to see your son. Now I advise you to turn around and walk right back out that door, he said stone-faced, motioning with his shotgun. Duncan put his hands in the air. I don't feel welcome right now, Richard. You could have at least offered me a refreshment first. Lillian's brother, who was outside shoveling the animal pens, overheard the commotion and ran inside. He grabbed Duncan from behind and threw him out of the house. He landed on the ground, then got up and dusted himself off. Lillian, you can take my house and my pension. Those are all just things, but you can't take my son. You hear me? He yelled, flailing his arms in the air. Lillian wept as she watched from her window. So on February 15th, Mr. Wickman came to your parents' residence, forced his way in, and was yelling aggressively. That's correct, Lillian replied. The court clerk sighed. <sighs> you wouldn't believe how many women I see like yourself that are dealing with vindictive exes, stalkers, perverts, peeping toms. The list goes on and on, she said, shaking her head. You made the right decision by getting a restraining order, though. It's a way for us to manage those sickos. Now if he does show up or starts harassing me, what happens then? You call the police and he gets arrested. Violating a restraining order is a class two misdemeanor. That's punishable by up to four months in jail. Lillian smiled, feeling somewhat relieved. April 11th. Duncan walked into the loaf and jug to speak to the store manager. A young kid in sneakers with the tongues flared out, looking a little on the sloppy side, walked out of the back room. Duncan extended his hand. Hello, I'm Duncan Wickman. I'm here for my interview. The kid shook his hand and pulled up his pants that were falling off his waist. Hi. If you just want to follow me to the back, we can get started, he said, opening up the half door that led behind the registers. Duncan followed him to a dimly lit office. The kid turned down his speakers that were blasting music. I got a few questions that corporate makes me ask. So why are you interested in a career with the loafing jug? To be honest, you were hiring and you were about five minutes from my apartment. Fair enough, the kid responded as he typed at his laptop. He looked closely at his screen. It says you used to be an attorney? I gotta ask, why are you applying at a gas station? Duncan chuckled and looked down at the floor. <laughs> well, I guess I wasn't the best attorney. So I wanted to try my luck in the retail trade sector. The kid stared blankly at him. Okay. Well, you're definitely qualified. Actually, probably overqualified. The last thing we need is a UA. You guys UA here? Duncan said, surprised. Unfortunately, yes. That won't be a problem, will it? Duncan left the store feeling disappointed when he noticed a man panhandling on the street corner. People seemed to be eagerly handing him money. Duncan pulled up at the stoplight rolled his window down and flagged him over. He approached his car with a smile on his face, surely expecting some money, or maybe even a pack of smokes. Hey, how much money do you make out here doing this? Excuse me, brother? Do the cops ever harass you? What the fuck you mean? You got some change or you just gonna waste my time? Duncan looked down and searched his compartments for change, but all he could find was a stick of gum. Hey, here you go. What the fuck is this? The light changed and Duncan began to drive off. The man threw the stick of gum at his car and huffed. April 20th Duncan looked out his window when he saw a tow truck hooking up to the front of his Mercedes. 
No, no! He yelled as he ran downstairs and into the parking lot. What are you doing? He shouted. The tow truck driver was a large burly man in suspenders. He looked up as he finished attaching his winch. You Douglas Wickman? Duncan nodded. I'm from the repo company. You didn't make your payments. He opened his passenger side door and pulled out some paperwork. I got your order right here. Mercedes-Benz C300. It says you're three months behind. I put that check in the mail last week! Duncan exclaimed in desperation. The tow truck driver just hopped in his cab, and as he drove away, Duncan watched his reflection get smaller and smaller in the truck's side mirror. He kicked the ground, then leaned on the light pole. Fuck! May 11th. Duncan sat on his couch holding the glass beer mug. His expensive Italian leather cushions had now lost some of their shape and were covered in stains and the occasional cigarette burn. He grabbed a terry cloth off the coffee table and began carefully buffing the mug to a shiny finish. The nightly news was on in the background. Tonight on News 5, Dean Saunders, a successful dentist and well-known socialite, was found not guilty of sexually assaulting several women at his practice. The news broadcast then cut to a clip of Saunders making a statement. I just want to first of all thank everyone who believed in my innocence. And secondly, say thank you to my attorney, Tony Spicola, who successfully defended me against these reprehensible accusations. Duncan frowned and changed the channel. Suck ass, he muttered to himself. Taking the bus to the business district, Duncan was exposed to the gritty underbelly of the city. He sat next to an elderly Hispanic woman. Do you need to switch seats? He asked her. She looked over at him, but didn't respond. Are you getting off soon? Do you need to be in the seat next to the aisle? No entiendo, she said with a confused look on her face. He stared out the window, watching the scenery fly by, when he could see someone glaring at him from the corner of his eye. He looked over his shoulder and saw a rough-looking man in tattered clothing scowling at him. He nervously hid his wallet in his sock and looked away, wishing the bus ride was already over. He got off at the bus stop and walked into the Walgreens. He went to the first aid section and took off his backpack, looking around for security cameras. He pretended to be reading labels as he unzipped his bag. At the moment he was about to steal a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, the store manager rounded the corner. Duncan clumsily fumbled the bottle, causing it, along with several others, to fall off the shelf. I know what you're doing, and you need to get the hell out of here before I call the cops, the manager said excitedly. I don't need any more of your kind stealing from here. Sorry, he whispered shamefully. He stepped over the pile of bottles and walked out the store. When he got home, he chugged the bottle of whiskey and rolled up his pant leg, exposing an open wound. He poured the whiskey over his laceration and painfully gritted his teeth from the sting of the alcohol. He then ripped an old t-shirt into a strip that he used as a bandage. The next morning, Duncan loaded up his backpack with all the personal belongings that would fit inside it. An eviction notice sat on his kitchen countertop. He ventured out into the city carrying a cardboard sign scribbled in marker that read, Hungry and Desperate. Anything helps. God bless. Seems pretty straightforward, he thought to himself as he sat on the curb, resting his back against the stoplight pole. He sat there for several hours as the traffic came and went. When someone would motion to him, he'd hold out his mug and they'd drop in some change or hand him some food or water. At the end of the day, he counted out his money. Nine dollars and fifty-two cents. Nine dollars for five hours of panhandling. It was somewhat discouraging, but he was able to buy a sandwich and a shooter of brandy. It helped to warm the bones as the temperature dropped in the evening. He took shelter in an alleyway. A stairwell on the side of the building that he slept next to served as an awning. The next morning he returned to the same spot, but seen that another man was already begging at the intersection. He continued walking across the street, then sat down next to a building, propping up his sign and placing his mug in front of him. Hey, you didn't see me over there? Duncan looked up from resting his head between his knees and saw the man that was standing at the intersection hovering over him. I already cleaned this spot. 
Sorry, I don't know how all this panhandling shit works, Duncan replied wearily. The man squinted. Hey, I recognize you. You were the sketchy dude that was asking me all the questions a while back, he snickered. <laughs> you stuck out like a sore thumb. What the fuck you doing out here? Duncan sighed. Probably the same thing you're doing out here. Can I be real with you? You look like a cocky white boy. Either that or the popo. Either one can get you killed out here. He looked down at Duncan's mug. Nice nah, beer mug. I'll be taking that as payment for renting you out this space. Excuse me? Duncan replied. What, you don't understand English now, white boy? Well, I'll repeat it in my language. Give me the mug before I knock your fucking teeth out. You ain't taking my fucking mug. The man lunged for it, and the two men began to scuffle, eventually falling down in an alley. The man pinned Duncan down and began punching him in the face. Duncan was dazed, but managed to swing his arm, catching the man in the side of the head with the beer mug. He rolled off him and grabbed his head. When he took his hand away, it was covered in blood. Duncan felt a rage erupt inside him. He jumped on top of him and began to bludgeon him, using the mug like a meat mallet. After several more blows, the man finally stopped struggling and his body went limp. The side of his head was caved in, and Duncan was covered in blood. He looked around to see if anyone had seen, then quickly checked the man's pockets for any money or valuables. He grabbed his feet and drug him next to a dumpster. Then, with every ounce of energy he had left, heaved his body inside. He sat down next to the dumpster out of breath. He wiggled his front tooth, which was loose from the punches he took to the face. May 23rd After several weeks of living on the streets, Duncan learned quickly how to defend himself, who to trust, and just how long he could stay in a certain spot before attracting the attention of law enforcement. The fashion district seemed to pay out the best. The rich folks were either some of the stingiest or most generous people you could encounter. He'd go for 30 or 40 minutes without getting so much as a window rolled down. Then, a 5 or a $10 bill would find its way into his beer mug. One day, while sitting in traffic, Lillian noticed a homeless-looking man with a cardboard sign walking down the rows of cars that sat gridlocked in front of her. She didn't think anything of it at first, checking her lipstick in the mirror and tending to Aiden, who was playing on his phone. But as the man trudged closer to her vehicle, she noticed him staring inside. When she got a better look, she gasped in shock. It was Duncan. He was thinner and his hair was long and messy looking. He had a bushy, sandy brown beard that was beginning to gray. He approached her Range Rover with a deranged look on his face and pounded on her window. Aiden put down his phone and screamed. Just calm down, baby. Everything's going to be all right, Lillian said to him. She tried to ignore Duncan, staring straight in front of her, but this only seemed to further agitate him. He pounded on her hood with both hands as he slowly walked around the vehicle. Aiden began crying. Lillian hugged him tightly. Leave us alone, she screamed, but Duncan just kept circling her SUV and hitting it. He finally stopped next to her window. He opened his mouth and grabbed his loose tooth, yanking on it with such force that blood splattered onto her windshield. What the fuck do you want? She pleaded. He grinned as blood ran down the side of his beard, seeming to take pleasure in tormenting her. She honked her horn and looked around frantically. Other cars began to honk their horns, too. Finally, she screamed and punched the gas. There was nowhere else to go but up on the median, so she drove over the curb then turned into oncoming traffic. She continued trying to comfort Aiden, who was still crying, then called the police on her phone. Yes, hello, this is Lillian Wickman. I have a restraining order on my husband, Duncan Wickman. Okay, ma'am. Did Mr. Wickman come to your work or residence? The operator asked. Well, no. I was stopped in traffic and he began banging on my vehicle. Okay, he was following you. No, he was walking on the side of the road. I believe he's homeless. Did he harm you? Not physically, but he scared me and my son very badly. The operator paused. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wickman, but unless your husband was stalking you or came to your home, we can't really do much. Lillian got a confused look on her face. Wait, my husband just attacked my car, traumatizing me and my son, and you can't do anything about it? 
I'm sorry, but unfortunately in that situation our hands are tied. Duncan sat outside of the 7-Eleven rocking back and forth while reading the Bible. He looked over at the glass beer mug that sat on the ground next to him when it suddenly dawned on him. Ever since he was given the mug, his life began a downward spiral. If he was to get rid of it, maybe things would turn around for him. He got up to throw it in the dumpster when he heard a familiar voice call to him. Duncan? Hey, is that you? He turned around, shielding his eyes from the afternoon sun, when he saw Tony Spicola standing in front of him. Here. Yeah. Tony tossed a wadded up dollar at him. He looked at his girlfriend and laughed, then turned to walk off. Wait, Duncan exclaimed. Tony turned back around. Here, I'd like to give you something too. He held the beer mug out towards Tony. Call it a token of my gratitude. Tony walked up to Duncan with a puzzled look on his face. Thanks, I guess, he said as he took the mug. A few minutes later, Duncan slipped his backpack over his shoulder as he got ready to leave. He turned his head suddenly to look towards the sound of screeching tires and crunching metal coming from the street. He walked up to the scene of a head-on collision between two cars, one of which looked just like the Audi that Tony drove. Smoke barreled out from under the hood and the horn was stuck on. Duncan got up close, waving away the smoke as he tried to get a better look. It was Tony's car. He laid slumped over in the driver's seat. His face was covered in blood. The horn finally cut off, and besides a few screams from nearby pedestrians, there was a harrowing silence. Tony regained consciousness and began coughing up blood. He looked around disoriented, then saw Duncan standing next to his car. <laughs> Help! <laughs> Please! His breasts were shallow and weak, and he struggled to get the words out. Well, Tony, sometimes life throws a curveball at you. Or, I guess in my case, a duffel bag full of curveballs. <laughs> I lost everything my family, my house, my dignity. <laughs> But I was finally able to share that misery with someone else. See, that's what life's about, Tony. Giving back. Sharing. You will learn that too one day. <laughs> Duncan tapped on his roof as to bid him farewell. <laughs> then kept walking up the street. <laughs> And that was A Token of Gratitude by author Brian Asbury. A good reminder that a pretty face will take you further than an ugly mug. A little about the author. Brian Asbury was born and raised in Pueblo, Colorado, and has spent most of his adult life there. Growing up, he was inspired by tales from the crypt and the Twilight Zone, and looks to bring back good storytelling and horror again. He's been a regular contributor for CTFDN, including The Chair in the Closet, White Coat Syndrome, Outskirts of Meeker Valley, and The Last Level. Fans can read A Token of Gratitude on Amazon Kindle by searching Brian Asbury. He also has an author's page on Facebook under Brian Asbury writer. He was recently featured in the Pueblo Chieftain, a local Southern Colorado newspaper that highlighted his stories on the CTFDN network and his future ventures. <clears throat> May I? Well, if it ain't my pushy salesman. Please, Drew. We're moving and shaking here. Don't forget to check out Brian's new story collection on Amazon, A Windowless Room, Excursions into Horror. Sounds right up your alley, doesn't it? Check the link up there. Or search Brian Asbury Books on Amazon. He'd also like to thank his lovely wife, Amber, and all his supporters. You know who you are. All right, change the subject. That's fine. Whoa, not yet, Chester. Soon, but not yet. 
and do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. You can get back on the wagon next year. For now, drink to your health. I'd like to take the time to say hi to a fan of the show. Mr. Johnny Rankin. How you doing, bud? I'm saying hello to Chester for you right now. Hold on. Chester? Johnny Rankin says hello. He's a fan of yours. Well, I'll be damned. Chester's in a good mood tonight, Johnny. He says hello right back at you. Normally, it's something rude. It's just his way. So, without further delay, Mr. Johnny Rankin, may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Next year, we're all kicking it up a notch, but for now, go fuck yourself. (sighs) Have a safe and happy new year, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.